Today, I'd like to invite you to go back to the journey of the triumphal entry. We are going to talk about whether this entry is really triumphal or not. But I'd like to go back with you to the story itself. And here it is. Mother, I'm very nervous. I heard from our owner that someone made a reservation for a new donkey. And I would be the one carrying him. I hope he's not too heavy for me to carry, as you know that I'm very small. I hope he's a gentle rider as well. I'm horrified by hearing stories about how other riders kicked the donkeys. My dear child, not to worry. I will accompany you when you carry on your first duty. I will be there to protect you and carry your load if it becomes too unbearable for you. Oh, I heard that my first customer is a famous person from Galilee. He heals the sick, feeds the hungry, and even raises the dead. I feel so honored to carry such a person on my back. I heard that he has a large following. I hope I won't be squeezed too hard by other people when I'm carrying him into the city. I'm sure everything will be all right, my dear. Sleep well. You have a noble task ahead. Hi, we are the disciples of Jesus. We are here to help pick up the donkeys which our Lord has reserved. Here are your donkeys. Oh, I thought we only reserved for one. Oh, it's a practice to send the young donkey's mother along for the first duty or first ride so that the little one won't be so scared. Don't worry, there's no extra charge for it. Mother, let's go. They are here. I can't wait to meet my rider. Do you think other prominent leaders of the city will come and greet us and escort us into the city? Wow, what a scene, my dear boy. It must be quite an experience for you today. Indeed, I felt like I was a Hollywood star when entering the city. So many people waved their palm branches at us and laid their clothes on the, on, the, on the road for me to walk on. Though I know they were not cheering for me, but my rider, I still felt so honored. I heard people shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Mother, do you know why people said those words? It sounds like he is more than just an important person. Oh, those words were very unusual, you see. People from all over the places come to Jer Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. You have heard the story of the Exodus and how the Israelites were, were to kill a lamb and put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost as a sign to escape the angel of death. Today is the 10th day of the month of Nisan. It is the day when Jewish families select the lamb for the Passover sacrifice. Oh, mother, please keep going. Is there any more secret about this man? The crowd was shouting to him as the son of David, which meant that he is the descendant of the kingly line. Would he be the one whom the Israelites have been waiting for as the Messiah? The one who has been prophesied by Zechariah? Was that the reason that we were recruiting, we were being recruited into the drama? Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. But mother, I do not quite understand why a king did not want to ride on a horse, but a donkey. I saw pictures in books where the Roman emperor or general came to town. They were always riding on a horse and a chariot. 
Yes, kings ride on horses and chariots after coming back from battle, showing off their victory. But when a king rides on a donkey, it signifies that it is a time of peace, where there will be no more killing or fighting. However, it does not look like this king comes to stir up a war. The Old Testament prophets refer to him as the Prince of Peace. That's precisely what people were not very happy about. The fact that this king had no interest to fight against the Roman government. Of course, this was a makeup story of the dialogue of these two donkeys who carry on the duty to carry our Lord Jesus. But this is our humble king, our Lord Jesus Christ. He had been very low key, as you might remember in the gospel, in talking about who he was, except to the close ones, to the disciples. But here, in the beginning of the Passion Week, this is the first time that Jesus publicly declared himself as the King of the Jews, as the King of Heaven. Why? Because the time has come. This triumphal entry into Jerusalem was a clear revelation of who Jesus was. People had been reacting differently towards Jesus' proclamation. We can basically divide them into three categories of people. The first category of people would be the disciples. The disciples were the ones who walked the closest with Jesus for three years before this week. Do you think the disciples understood Jesus very well since they have been together for three years? Throughout the gospel, we saw stories after stories that the disciples also had their own agenda of following Jesus for whatever reason. Even though gradually they came to know the Lord better and better. However, even up to this point, the last week of Jesus' days on earth, majority of the disciples still did not truly understand the identity and mission of Jesus. Do you remember that Peter once confessed Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God? But then, he's also the one who's, who did not want Jesus to go to the cross. And he's not the only one. Most of the disciples were so enthusiastic and excited about what they saw with what Jesus has done, healing the sick, feeding the 5,000, all the miracles that they have witnessed. They had high expectation on this leader, that they, this teacher, this leader that they have been following. However, up to this point, they still did not truly understand what it means to be the disciples. They they were not still very sure if they are, they are willing to take up the cross and follow him. Disciples still argue about who is the biggest one, who is the most powerful one, who would be the leader amongst themselves. Jesus, riding on the donkey, being the Prince of Peace, wanted to once again show the disciple that he is not here to fight for anything. The second group of people in this scene, in this Passion Week experience, were the religious leaders. We heard more about them as the week unfolded, as we had just read the Passion narrative. If you remember Jesus' encounter with the religious leaders, it was not always present. Why? because the Pharisees, the priests, and the scribes, somehow they were kind of like the target of Jesus' message. Jesus often told parables or teachings um, cha that challenge what these, this group of people were doing. The Jewish authority disliked Jesus because he challenged them for their superficial religious practices. They might know a lot of scripture, 
they might pray a lot in the um, in the temple. They might be doing all sorts of very well respected religious practices, but they did not understand the heart of God, and they rejected Jesus as the Son of God. The third group of people walking alongside with Jesus and the disciples and everybody in this story was the crowd. If you have been to any concert or ball game, you know the impact of the crowd. Who are the crowd? They are the people who just follow like a superstar, or, you know, they, they are the people who kind of look up to a certain figure and, you know, cheer for them. But there's not really a personal relationship between the crowd and the superstar. They might really love, you know, this movie star or this singer or, you know, uh, this um, baseball player, whatever that is. But there's no personal relationship. They cheer for the person because of the success or victory or popularity that this person brings. But they don't really understand what it means to follow the person. And this, that's exactly what's happening in the story. When Jesus entered Jerusalem as a king, the crowd was in the midst of the Passover feast. There were a lot of festivities, lots of people. The town was full. It's kind of like one of those um, uh, Olympic or Super Bowl experience where everybody traveled into the town. All the hotels are full. All the restaurants are full. The whole city was just full of energy. And now here they come witnessing this interesting event of a king riding on a donkey going into the the, uh, the city, and they were just following. Some of them might have known Jesus. Some of them might have seen him performing miracles. And they might think, oh, I want to see what's going to happen. You know, is he going to be overthrowing the Roman government? Is he going to do something heroic? What's going to happen with this ritual or ceremony? The crowd followed Jesus with various motivations. Some like his popularity, others follow him because of his miracles. Some might express some sort of physical benefit from Jesus. Many were hoping that Jesus would be the Messiah that they had been waiting for. Maybe this is the time that he's going to take action, finally. And the crowd wanted to support the kind of leaders that they were expecting. But once again, the crowd had no intimate relationship with Jesus. As we think about these three groups of people, I'd like to invite us to think about who we are. Who do we identify with? Would we claim to be the disciples? Do we feel like we really truly understand who Jesus is? Or are we kind of like the religious leaders feeling uncomfortable because Jesus is always challenging our status quo and what we are doing? Or are we like the crowd? We want to follow Jesus. We want to go to the church because somehow it feels good or somehow it gives me some sort of benefits. What is our motivation for following Jesus? How close are we walking with him? What are we expecting in return for our commitment to Jesus? We often hear people encouraging people to uh, encouraging brothers and sisters to serve in the church, saying that, oh, you know, when we see Jesus, he's going to say you are a good and faithful servant and you would have a crown with lots of jewels on it, right? <laughs> Is that our motivation for serving God? It is easy for us to dismiss the religious leaders and the crowd as if they had no relationship with us. And yet, many times we committed the same mistakes unconsciously. 
When religious practice becomes superficial, mechanical, it overshadows the essence of our faith. When we feel good and secure about the effort we put into our spiritual life, or become too comfortable in our religious pursuits, we become the religious leaders. We forgot about the most important thing about following Jesus. Sometimes we don't like to be challenged. Everybody has an ego within us. It feels uncomfortable when somebody is saying that, oh, you know, this is not your true motivation or somebody is uncovering our inside world. When we try to find benefits in believing Jesus, whether it's getting the passport to heaven, healing our sickness or our loved one's sickness, or adopting a theology of prosperity, thinking that the more we love God, the better we can do in this, on this earth, becoming rich, becoming influential, we become one of the crowd who join this party. We could also be like the disciples, wanting to follow Jesus when Jesus was performing heroic acts, feeding the 5,000, raising Lazarus from the dead. But when it comes to the path of walking towards the cross, we might have a second thought. This story is more than just a historical account of the beginning of Jesus' last week on earth. This story, it is a call for all who are following Jesus or claim to follow Jesus to examine our motivations and our hearts. So what is the true meaning of discipleship? In the epistle passage that we just read, it says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used at his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness as being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. What does it mean to be having the same mind of Jesus? It means to have the mind of Christ it's not just the mind. Sometimes we only think about faith as thinking or beliefs, that is cognitive beliefs. This means that we are to imitate Jesus Christ and to be shaped by his worldview rather than our worldview. Jesus prayed to God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if you remember before the Passion Week in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was still praying. As much as he did not want to walk this path of the cross, he was still praying to the Father, not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus did not only teach the disciples to pray in a certain way, but he embodied the prayer that he taught the disciples to pray. Jesus introduced a new kind of logic of living and a new code of relationships that help people to go back to the original intent of how God created us by being his disciples we are invited to and we need to abide to the code of relationships and the logic that Jesus 
gave us. What it means to live on earth as if the kingdom has broken into this world. What it means to live fully as someone who is being created in the image of God. And not just ourselves, but seeing each other as created in the image of God. This humble Cain, our Lord Jesus, voluntarily took up, voluntarily giving up his rights and his status, even though he could claim it any time, at any place. Jesus was not forced to give up his kingship or his status as God, but he chose to give it up, and he demonstrated to us what servanthood or servant king looks like. Not just, not only did he just, did he give up his status, but he walked one step more to sacrifice himself for the people who do not deserve, like you and me. Jesus' whole life was a countercultural act of how this human world operates. When this human world promotes upward mobility, to be more powerful, to be more rich, Jesus' worldview teaches us that we need to humble ourselves and go downward in our social mobility. We are to serve each other as we are invited to remind ourselves every year in the Monday Thursday service to wash each other's feet. And remember, back in Jesus' days, their feet were not as clean as the feet that we have today. Today we have shoes, we have socks. When we take off our shoes and our socks, our feet are quite clean. But back in those days in Israel, they wore sandals, they walk on very dusty land, their feet were dirty. And think about washing the feet of these people. A few weeks ago, a friend told me about a book called The Rough Sleepers. It was a doctor's um, account of how he got involved in um, working with the homeless and the people who have nothing on this earth, basically. And he, I, I couldn't remember exactly the details, but he entered into this home or facility that welcomed homeless people, and he didn't know what to do. He was having this heroic thought about, I'm a doctor, I'm here to help them. And it came a, a Catholic sister who was in charge of the facility. And the doctor asked her, what am, what am I supposed to do here? You know, tell me who is the first patient I'm going to see. And the Catholic sister told him, wash the feet first. And as he uncovered the feet of these people, then he realized what it meant to serve the lowly and the poor and to live like Jesus Christ. The human world promotes self-centeredness, promotes our personal rights and freedoms. But in Jesus' kingdom, Jesus' world, he promotes self-sacrifice, self-giving, and love. As we enter this holy week, let us enter into this journey of Jesus, not as a bystander, not as part of the crowd, but as someone who have count the cost and say to ourselves that, yes, I'm willing, I'm willing to walk this path of the cross.